the Grace Foundation taking care of the needy and marginalised in New Zealand, a centre of influence in the heart of New York City, and Mission Challenge around the world coming up next. Hello and welcome to the program. Coming to you today from New York City. Directly behind me on the corner here is a building known as the Windermere. And in 1901, Pastor Stephen Haskell and his wife Hetty moved into this apartment building. This was quite the building back then in 1901. In fact, it was very popular for the new class of single young women who were starting to work out in businesses. And the Haskells arrived here and they were quite taken by the fact that there was an elevator. They were quite taken by the fact that there was a very multicultural area. And it's fascinating that in that year, when it was the first crash on Wall Street, when in the summer people were suiciding because of the terrible heat wave, at that time the Haskells came as missionaries into the heart of New York City. Well, on today's program we have a lot of mission stories, but first up, Let's travel to New Zealand and see what's happening with the Grace Foundation. As more people flock to the cities, the need for Jesus in the urban areas grows. Big cities encourage busy lifestyles with little or no time to even think about religion. But in many people's hearts, there is a need for something more, a need for Jesus. Many are just waiting for someone to reach out to them, to care for them, and to share the message of hope with them. The city of Auckland, New Zealand is one of the largest cities in the South Pacific. A group of Adventists in Auckland wanted to reach out to those in need of God's love. Church members started Grace Foundation and took on the challenge of unconditionally loving the people of Auckland, despite their past or current situation. It's a big experience itself, you know, to meet these beautiful people that, that just love anyone, you know, it doesn't really matter what crime you've done in your life, you know, because that's, I guess, you know, that's the way of Jesus, you know, everyone is, he loves everyone and anyone, and everyone can be forgiven. Tomati's life hasn't been easy. Grace Foundation strives to show the love of Jesus to people like Tomati. The kind of people that God sends into our care, uh, from uh, homeless, uh, mental health, and also mainly from corrections. Grace Foundation offers a range of holistic services to marginalized members of the community. An important aspect of their ministry is developing one-on-one -on -one relationships with people who want to turn their lives around or just need an opportunity to succeed. Just the people, man, you know, the um, staff members are really loving and um, they love everyone, you know, it doesn't matter what you've done in your life. As the love of Christ is shown to these people, they see and understand that God truly accepts and forgives. This weekend, people are attending a relationship retreat. Couples learn from the Bible what it means to love selflessly and put God first. They attend seminars, small group discussions, and learn practical skills about how to participate in a healthy relationship. It's Saturday evening, and a bus pulls up to church with another group of people. This Grace Foundation-operated bus picks up members in marginalized communities to bring them to church. The vibrant worship ignites people's passion to grow closer to God. As the pastor calls for people to come up and leave their burdens before God, people's hearts are touched and they come to the front to pray. Many of these people have felt judged in society's eyes, but here, they feel at home. Jesus has changed my life, 
you know, before I gained the Holy Spirit, I, you know, I always thought that, you know, I was um, guilty, heaps. But once I gained the Holy Spirit, I, f I felt the true power of innocence from um, our Lord Jesus. And um, the Holy Spirit has all the directions. Please pray as church members in New Zealand continue to be a light in this dark world. Pray that Grace Foundation can touch the lives of the marginalized people of Auckland. Thank you for your support of mission. My guest is Pastor Bloody Leno, who is the Director of Multicultural Ministries here for the Greater New York Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Pastor Bloody, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, Gary. Now, we're in a church-owned building here in the center of Manhattan. Describe the neighborhood. What, what's outside here? Well, this is Midtown Manhattan. Um, we're right across from uh, some landmarks of New York City right across the library, public library and Bryan Park, only two blocks from um, Times Square and right at the corner of Fifth Avenue and 40th Street. So right in the center and in the heart of it all. This place is just amazingly busy. You come here on a summer's day and the park is packed full of activity, right? Yes, uh, you have uh, things such as uh, musicals and uh, theater in the park, uh, movies in the park, uh, yoga and exercise in the park throughout the summer year-round really right now so we have thousands of people passing past here every day what is happening here at the moment we have a great opportunity uh, to connect with so many people here uh, in this building that the church has owned for a few decades now uh, we have a bookstore that is uh, that's been active for all these years and as of recently, we've uh, implemented and started uh, some activities as a Life Hope Center, as a center of influence. So some of the things that we do here uh, is uh, lunch seminars and happy hour talks. We like to um, explore those two windows within the day that are the, the two windows where people of our community are available to maybe sit down and listen to a seminar, to a talk or a workshop while they savor some healthy vegetarian food. And we've been able to provide that for, uh, for our community here. Wonderful, and you had one of those events today. Describe what happened at lunchtime today. We did. Um, we had um, about uh, 20 people here uh, who took their lunch break and decided to spend it here with us. We had a nice seminar given by uh, a counselor and a therapist, a family and marriage therapist. So he was talking about relationships and how to identify challenges uh, within uh, relationships. It was beautiful. People came in here, um, some of them, most of them, only have maybe 20, 30 minutes uh, as a lunch break. So they were able to come and savor some of our food that we were featuring here and uh, while they were listening and, and being interactive in this workshop. So mm. it was a great opportunity. Um, as we go around, we see that the majority of these people are, are um, attendees, people who, who are part of our community. They work here, they, most of them commute, as everybody in these uh, surroundings, they commute uh, to the city to work. And uh, it's a great opportunity to be able to expose uh, most of them to Christian values uh, when it comes to relationships and, and talking about uh, Valentines and love and romance. Mm -hmm. So you're connecting with things that are, uh, are needs in the community. And you've actually done a study, a demographic study of this community. So you understand the people who live here and work here. Yes, so that is uh, actually vital to do in order to connect with the community. First of all, we need to understand the community. community and not, not just being around here, which is very important to do, uh, rubbing shoulders with them, but also uh, from a demographic study point of view. So yes, we've conducted a number of those studies in order to be able to understand the community better so that we can serve the community better. Um, we're surrounded by business people, people who, are, uh, who, who work in this high-rise commercial buildings, who work for um, 
investment banks and big buck uh, companies and they, they uh, require uh, quality programs and uh, we try our best here to uh, provide that and enable uh, in order to connect with them as best as we can. Yeah. And to provide a bit more context, I understand right, right next to us here, a new apartment building is going up. And how much would it cost me to buy a one bedroom apartment? Well, well our neighbors here are, are selling the one bedroom apartments for $2.5 million. <laughs> $2.5 million, okay, I'll think that one through carefully. <laughs> Just briefly, can you tell me somebody whose life has been touched already through this center? Yes, um, we've been here working since 2013 with these uh, types of events. We have a number of them, and we, tr we like to channel some of the people who come through these events to the other things that we're featuring here. We have counseling, we have uh, uh, spirituality uh, groups that, that meet here and study the Bible together. Um, we have uh, uh, after-school programs and, and different kinds of uh, workshops and seminars that we provide. One of them uh, is Julie. Julie uh, started attending here a couple of our events and she felt that she needed to, to get engaged more and she asked whether uh, any of the other programs would be fitting for her. So I introduced her to Eric, one of our leaders of, this, uh, of the groups, study groups that we have here throughout the week and Julie connected with Eric and uh, they've been uh, studying together uh, the Bible in this group. Uh, we have about 15 to 18 um, young adults who l work around here, are professionals, and in their busy weeks and busy day to day, they can't find necessarily the time to connect with, spiritual, with a spiritual group or with someone who, um, who can help them in their spiritual journey. We, we were happy to provide that for Julie, so uh, we still see her every Wednesday, every Thursday when they come here for their studies and uh, she's a very active uh, person and she's actually brought uh, many of her friends over to, to be with them. Fantastic. Blady, thanks so much for sharing with us. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Thank you. And viewers at home, please remember to pray for centres of influence in urban areas all around the world. They're multiplying, they're growing, and they're proving to be a platform to put Christ's method into practice. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to New York City, and next up we travel to a warmer part of the world, Johannesburg, South Africa. I'm talking with Global Mission Pioneers, Elder Nisus Sabanda, at the Berea International Seventh-day Adventist Church in Pretoria, South Africa. Mrs. Sabanda, how long have you and your husband been Global Mission Pioneers? We have been doing Global Pioneer Mission work for 11 years now. Wow. That's a long time. Yes. Elder Sabanda, I understand that about a year um, after being Global Mission Pioneers, you experienced something very unfortunate. Tell me a little bit about that. Yes, um, the devil works in some subversive manner. I got arrested and um, I was sent to prison on remand. And for five months, I was um, packed in there there was no case because they did not have, actually they did not have any um, docket. Which there was they no had, charge made. There was no charge which they had uh, prepared. Every time I go to court, they would tell me the case has been remanded to next week. The case has been remanded to next week. And meanwhile, there was no charge sheet. As I was in the prison, um, in many cases, the prison authorities would actually send other people who have come to prison with worse problems like murder, etc., mm -hmm. for me to counsel them whilst I was incarcerated. Okay. Yes, you see, as I was in prison, there were quite a number of things that were happening. People that were worshipping on Sunday, sometimes they would call me to come and preach. 
to some of those uh, prisoners, you know, the inmates, because I was still at the um, awaiting trial section. And um, when I was released, because there was no charge, I went back to prison the following Sabbath together with my wife. And from that, from then on, we started, um, you know, prison ministry in a much tenser manner. Pretoria Central Prison became the first prison in South Africa to be installed of, um, you know, Hope Channel through our ministry. And we have already installed about um, four of those units at the, you know, at one prison. But we're still negotiating to uh, install more. Tell me, what was that like for both of you? You know, you had been in prison for, for five or six months, um, and you on the outside worried and praying and to go back, to turn around and go back. Why did you do that? Did you feel a, a, the Lord calling you to be involved in this particular ministry? Did he lay it on your heart? Did you want to do it? You know, this incident that happened, that my husband was incarcerated there, it opened our eyes and our minds that God wants to use us there. So we felt the Lord wants to use us because there was so much that we we could see that we can do help the guys there, because some of them did not have a relationship with Christ. They did not have, know Christ. So we, we were encouraged that God wants to use us there. Now, as a result of your ministry, do you know of people who have come to know Christ? Yes, there are quite a number that have come to know Christ. Some of them, we have adopted them as our children. And in fact, um, our ministry is not only concentrated to the inmates, it has now spread over even to the um, officers themselves because uh, the officers, quite a number of these officers, um, it's either they are stressed and they need a lot of counseling. Sometimes, you know, would go there and do the counseling instead of going to the prisoners, we actually go to the officers themselves. Elder Sabanda, I understand that you are the leader of the Global Mission Pioneer work in, in Pretoria. And you mentioned that your wife goes to the prison a couple days a week. What else do you do? What else is involved in your Global Mission Ministry at this point? Well, um, in the Global Mission Ministry, there's quite a lot that is happening currently. Um, Pretoria being a metropolitan area, there's a lot of need for um, the work to be done. So sometimes, you know, we do share. When she is at the prison, I'm, you know, on the front. I've got, um, you know, three colleagues that I'm, you know, working with within the city. And uh, we go out, knock doors. Not only that, but we are also involved in um, um, arranging and conducting evangelistic meetings within the city. Well, there, there are quite a number of other uh, congregations that we have uh, managed to pioneer. Um, one such congregation is a congregation up in Johannesburg, uh, where there was this Pente it was a Pentecostal congregation, and um, we managed to share some truth with them. By God's grace, you know, the whole church plus the pastor, you know, became Adventist, and the pastor himself currently. Is um, training at Solusi. He's he's only left with only a year to complete to come back into the ministry, which actually was as a result of the global mission pioneer. What is it that keeps you motivated? Keeps you in the ministry? Well, I remember the words of one of our um, division officers who happened to be a young man when I was already a trained uh, pastor, he said to me, listen, when the finger of God is pointed at you, it doesn't matter where you go, and doesn't matter what you do, 
you will come back <coughs> to do what he has asked you to do. And global mission work, um, it's something that is inborn, something that is um, part of our lifestyle. And it is very difficult to part with it. And, and, and we enjoy doing it because we cannot just stop doing it until he tells us to stop. Mm, very good. Elder and Mrs. Sabanda, thank you for your time and for your sharing a little bit of your life as Global Mission Pioneers here in Pretoria. Well, you're welcome. You're welcome. Historically, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been strongest in rural areas and on islands. And we have neglected the great urban areas. Not so long ago, I visited some of the cities and I'd like to show you a video now that shows some of the challenge that we are facing. When many of us think of the mission field, we still think in terms of small rural villages. Now villages are still important, but increasingly these are our mission fields, the growing cities of the world, where millions and millions of people are congregating. They're not going anywhere soon, except they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And as the people who are walking these streets, living in these apartments, working in these offices, it's the people living in makeshift housing in, in hovels, in, in slums. It's the rich, it's the poor who need to know Jesus Christ. The growing urban areas of the world are our, our greatest mission challenge, but they're also our greatest mission opportunity. Imagine that you were standing here with me in the capital city of Myanmar, Yangon, right here in the heart of the city. And then imagine that there was a circle around us with a radius of 3,000 miles, 5,000 kilometers. Now that's a relatively small space, but in that area, 60% of the world's population lives. And this is an area where the poorest people of the world live and representatives from the world's major religions but the fewest Christians. Adventist work began in the Middle East, right here in the ancient land of Egypt. Back in the 1870s, some people sent some literature now, more than 100 years later, 140 years later, the Adventist church throughout the Middle East is a minority of minorities. In fact, if you could imagine a line of people stretching here from Cairo, Egypt, directly all the way to Beirut, Lebanon, nearly 600 kilometers. And if each person was spaced just one meter apart, you could walk that entire line and you would meet only three or four Adventists. In the face of numbers such as that, we ask the question, who is sufficient for these things? And the answer is, not us, only him. When the Apostle Paul visited here in Athens some 2,000 years ago, he discovered a mission field. It was a city full of idols. And when he met with the philosophers up on Mars Hill near the Acropolis, he connected the good news of Jesus Christ to the culture in which they were living. He made that important connection. He talked about the altar to the unknown God and showed them how that was pointing to the one true God. Today, we also face tremendous mission fields. We think of the Middle East. We think of the rising number of cities with populations way more than a million people. We think of the 1040 window. We think of the, the growth in secularism and postmodernism. And we even think of the challenge of passing on the mission spirit to our children. 
And as we face these challenges, we know that we have the power of the Holy Spirit. And we also know the importance of following the example of Jesus himself and the Apostle Paul in finding ways to make the good news meaningful, attractive and understandable to people in various cultures, in various contexts. When Global Mission began in 1990, there were some 6 million Seventh-day Adventist church members. Today, there are more than 18 million. And thousands of churches have been planted in remote Amazon villages such as this one, in large cities such as New York. And around the world today, we see that church planting is at the fastest rate ever. But huge challenges still remain. We look at the vast megalopolises around the world. More than 50% of the world's population live in cities, and that's rapidly growing. And we think of the 1040 window, where most people have still not even heard the name of Jesus. And we think of the secular and postmodern West, which seems to be growing and growing in unbelief. When we look at the challenge, we say, who is sufficient for these things? The only thing that we can do is to recommit ourselves to a fresh vision of mission and to the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, I hope that you've enjoyed today's program and more than that, I hope that you've been challenged and inspired by what you've seen and heard. Around the world today, we see so many mission challenges from small remote areas through to the teeming megalopolises around the world where every day the populations are just growing and growing and growing. And I wanna thank you for your continuing support for mission, for your personal involvement, for your prayers, and for your financial contributions, your mission offerings, your tithes, your gifts to Global Mission. It does make a tremendous difference. Before we go, I'd like to offer you a wonderful gift. This is a tremendous book. It's called It's Time, a brand new book full of frontline urban mission stories. This isn't a book of theory or, or theology. It's a book of practical illustrations, practical examples of holistic urban mission. Well, for Adventist Mission, I'm Gary Krause, and I hope that you can join me next time right here on Mission 360.